I'm sitting with Diane Tor, who is uh, in New York City for what seems to be a Diane Tor festival, uh, the New York premiere of a documentary on her life work called Man for a, Man for a Day, and, uh, and a time to reconnect with a lot of the students and uh, people that you have done work with over the last 30 years here in New York City. Thank you. Um, we're in a wonderful, authentic Mexican restaurant on the Lower East Side. If you can believe there still is something authentic on the Lower East Side, it is here. Um, and this is she's unwrapping her tamale. Okay. And, last night at, and, and last night at Dixon Place, uh, Diane presented a um, oh, a tribute <coughs> to her brother, Donald. Thank you. Thank you. Some, Donald, some water. Sorry. Thanks. Uh, we're very busy getting our coffee and our, <laughs> our breakfast together here. I and you'll hear some background noise because this is a small little place, but our, the, the, the location is very, has always seemed to be very important to you, Diane. Well, yeah. <laughs> Isn't it to everybody? I have an idea, a request. Why don't we take our hat off oh, okay. so they can see your face? Sure. I'm going to give you the Okay. You came to New York City in the middle 70s, is that correct? Mm. Go. 76. 76. And you came from? Well, I came from the UK. Uh -huh. I went to art school in England, Darlington College of Arts. But I grew up in Scotland, in Aberdeen, north of Scotland. Are you voting in the election? Yeah, from, I will definitely vote, yeah. You want to share with us what you're voting? Well, you know, there are for and against. I mean, the idea of being independent is kind of scary because I am scared. Of, well, no, but it's not just that. It's just nationalism itself I find questionable. And what's that about? But at the same time, I understand the desire to dispense with the Tories. You know, and they run everything. I mean, who votes for Tories in England, in the UK? It's, they're all in the southeast and southwest. Nobody kind of in the north or in Scotland votes Tory. Maybe one or two people. There aren't, and it's just to say that there aren't many Tory MPs north of somewhere like, I don't know. Um, well, the Midlands, you know. Anyway, yeah. There's a lot of good things to be had, but also a lot of things. You grew up in Scotland, and um, the UK is such a class based. Um, yeah. System, how would you identify the, the class that you'd love? Um, I'd say probably lower middle class, something like that. Parents were professional? No, my father, yeah, my father was a mechanical engineer, mm -hmm. and my mother was a housewife, and then she was a secretary. And I had two brothers, but... Um, Older and younger? They're both older, mm -hmm. yeah. You were the baby? I was the youngest, yeah. So... I had, to, I had to fight my corner a lot with my brothers, you know, I had to make sure that they, well, I had to make sure that they fought with each other instead of fighting with me. <laughs> and did you, how did you get to art school in London? Um, it was actually in Devon, in, in, in England. Devon. A long journey, I mean, I didn't go to college until I was 26, and before that, I worked for an agency. I was a temp secretary, and then I worked for this agency. It was a sort of help service for young people in London, run by. We used to go to pop festivals and help people who were high on drugs. And then uh, I went to Afghanistan with this organization to set up an organization there, visiting people in jail who'd been arrested for drugs. That was in 1973. Did you go with your main career? No. She fell in love with an Afghan man and changed her, wrote that whole book about... Yeah. <laughs> no. I, I, in fact, I had no idea at that time that... Joe yeah. No, I had no idea. No, I, I was working for this agency. And I, I just want to say that I, I that, that was a little titter about Jermaine. I have enormous respect for the work that mm. she did. And I did know no, her no. in the 60s when she lived here sure. before her, her feminist fame. Yeah, yeah. 
So you had had a rounded experience, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. And then you decided what? Well, when I was in Afghanistan, I did a lot of dancing because they have these great musicians. They play this down, this two-string instrument. Mm -hmm. Well, you never see women dancing in Afghanistan. I mean, this is pre. Russian invasion, pre-Taliban, when you had all these different tribes living side by side, as they had for centuries. And some women were veiled, and some wore brightly colored dresses, and some women, you know, they were all different. Um, was it a secular society? Um, I don't think so. I think, I think it was tribal? more, yeah, definitely tribal, definitely. And they didn't have a, a developed telecommunication system at all. So what went on in Kabul, Nobody, nobody paid any attention. They just got on with their lives, you know, as they have for centuries. You know. um, um, I mean, it was fascinating that opportunity to go to Afghanistan, um, visiting people in jail, and I went to a woman's jail in Kabul. And what was that like? Well, there were women in there who who been sent to jail with their children for slapping their husband's face. Incarcerated. Disobedience, disrespect of the husband, could get um, through jail time with your kids, and and also he he a lot of the men had other wives, you know, this one less to deal with, one less to take care of. At this point, would you have said that you were a conscious feminist, or you were just a young, vivacious, status <laughs> woman in the world? No, I was a Marxist feminist. From, you know, 68 on, very, very involved in women's liberation, as it was called then. Juliet Mitchell. Um, Juliet Mitchell and uh, Susan Robottom. You know, I, in fact, the first women's liberation meeting I went to was hosted by Juliet Mitchell. Wow. That was in 1968, Kentish Town, this place called, it was called Hole in the Wall. It was a meeting place, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I've always been very active. And when I went to art school, I... They never had any political anything at Dartington, and I just was the spitfire. I went through the place, you know, demanding that everybody get called Miss and not Miss, and um, spend a certain amount of the li library's money on feminist books and help the cleaners to unionize, and you know. Well, this is a very particular time, though. 1968, yeah. you had the French student. No, but I didn't go to art. I didn't go to school until '74. No, but I was working in, in London. <clears throat> I was working in London um, before that, and and got very involved in. So, how did, did do you remember if you did read or and if you did what kind of impact she was? No firestone. No, of course, dialectics of sex. No. Yeah. You sucked up all that stuff. I mean, a, that was, to me, the most radical book. Oh, definitely. Phenomenal. Um, you know, when I, when I came to this country in 76, I worked for this feminist newspaper called Majority Report mm -hmm. on Sheridan Square. It's mm -hmm. above the, what's now what's the, the editor about? It was Nancy Borman. She's, she's not here anymore. But um, all kinds of people came through there, like... Um, Susan Brown Miller and Kate Millett and Valerie Solanas and I mean all these people came through and I, I met them you know in that milieu I and mean, when you work for an alternative or a feminist press or whatever you have to do everything paste up and lay out and selling ads and writing articles and interviews you know it's like the majority report in um, off our backs with sort of the two principal print vehicles of yeah, feminist. feminist exactly yeah um, you know, when I first came here, I, I had I had nothing. I, I all I had was a J1 student visa to study at the Cunningham Studios for a year. Dance. Yeah, that's my background is in dance. Yeah. I studied with a lot of dance revolutionaries like Steve Paxton, who developed contact with musicians. He came to. Did you climb a wall? 
climb a wall, no. And you never climbed a wall with Steve Jackson? No, but I'm sure that would be an exercise that he would do, yeah. I can imagine. And he became a friend and he came to Dartington. It was the first time that Steve Paxton, the first time that contact organization was uh, shown or taught in, in the UK. And that was in 75. And Yvonne? And Yvonne, Yvonne Rayner, she never came to the UK. She was in her filmmaking period then. But uh, the woman who was our head of dance department, Mary, Mary Fulkerson, she was from Illinois. And she knew all these amazing people. Trisha Brown. Oh, well, she didn't bring Trisha Brown. Nancy Topf, who later died, unfortunately. But she did a lot of release work working with the um, pelvis. That was her specialty. The, the, um, Do you think that's not a gender-based issue for dancers? What? Pelvis. Oh. Um, well, actually, I don't know. I don't know if it's gender based. But Nancy's thing was the psoas muscle, and the psoas muscle is the main postural muscle mm -hmm. attached um, to the to the, the vertebrae at the back, and then goes through the, the abdomen, and then attaches to the the, the um, femur bones. You know, the greater the um, acetabulum. The, Head of the femur bones in the body. So you have the sheet of muscle, which is the main postural muscle, so us. And if you don't develop that, you know, you get lodorsis, for instance. Anyway, a lot of crawling in her classes. But um, I'm just. So you're very body conscious. Yeah, and I think for me, you know, I learned a lot through the body. I should have got my book. I just realized you probably would have. I have a book, you know. What's your book? It's called. Oh, I should have brought it. I have a book with some copies of it. It's called um, Sex, Drag, and Male Roles, Investigating Gender as Performance. When did that come out? That came out in 2010. So the University of Michigan Press. But I wrote it with um, Steve Bottoms, who was a professor at Glasgow University at the time. He's a theater historian. He also wrote the foreword to Penny Arcade's book. He's a, he's a lovely guy. I really enjoy the collaboration. He's a nice, sensitive academic. He's lovely. How special. He is right. very special. No, so I, I really did well. So having... Let me pull you back for a moment. Mm. It's 1976, 1977, 1978. Right. You're in New York. Right. You are a radical Marxist lesbian. <laughs> Marxist. Yeah. I, was, I wouldn't call myself a lesbian. You're a radical Mar Marxist, Marxist, Marxist feminist. Marxist feminist, yeah. I, you know, I was very involved in the lesbian scene. I would go to the Duchess, Bonnie and Clyde. So, well, you know, that, was done, that was done at that time with yeah. feminism. But um, and I also have always had women lovers and also men, too. I mean, it's not... I haven't been partial. In that, that, that was an accident, by the way, of my saying um, lesbian. Because I think you have created, at least for my days, an illusion of what is she, you know? Uh, and then you just settle on this guy in, you know, um, which is, which is, but I that's think a, ultimately it's what we hope we all can do. Right? An individual. You know, this person's an individual. Now, when did you have your daughter? Um, she was period? born in 1983. And, um, Oh God, it's so stupid I didn't bring my book. Anyway, I was actually selling the book at, at the film, when the film was shown in the college. So, sorry, my, my daughter. Um, how did that come about? Well, so I, we're, we're talking about 78, 79. Um, that was a very experimental time yeah, in downtown New York in music, in visual arts, in dance. A lot of a lot. I did a lot of work at PS122. Mm -hmm. um, I was working for a go-go as a go-go dancer in New Jersey, working in all these very nefarious um, working men's bars in Patterson, Harrison, C. Caucus, Newark. Um, you know, How did you square that with your radical feminism. Well, this was interesting, because how did I? And this was an issue for me. This is important for kids today who think sex work is not... A lot of sex work is done by artists because it's the only way they can afford to pay the money. I know. Well, I didn't have a green card. You know, how was I going to survive? 
at that time there was a lot more communication between artists, a lot of sharing that went on. So American friends would say, well, why don't you just make up a social security number? It's just four numbers and two numbers and three numbers. And I'm like, oh, okay. And they said, but try to be consistent. Don't keep changing. <laughs> so I used that to get to work as um, an art model, SVA and Parsons. Um, and then I, when I started go-to dancing um, in New Jersey, that, that was a dilemma for me as a feminist. And at the very beginning, when I first started working, I thought, oh my god, this is so boring. It's so formulaic. Can't these men see how formulaic this is? And I was a punk, you know. Yeah. And so I, I created this punk performance, which was a parody of the dancing, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did do because I never and made they ate it up. No, I never made any tips. <laughs> Except for the Mexican immigrants who didn't know what go good was. <laughs> so I had a conversation with myself, well what are you gonna do? You know, either you're gonna do it or you're not. But you know, I decided that I would do it, but I would do it on my terms. Um, which is maybe not so possible now, I don't know. But uh, I saw it as an opportunity also to explore ideas of the erotic. I mean, that, that's where the erotic is fixed. As we see it in, in this world. And in your cultural world, and in your feminist world, um, was there any criticism of you, or was there support of you making this choice? Because this is before the Columbia Bad Girl Feminism Conference, mm. which took place in 1980, I think. Yeah. I didn't go to that. I, I, um... I did a performance about Koga Dancing, I did several performances. The first was at WOW in 1980. I brought in these Goga Dancers to work with me. Real good. 81. Yeah, oh, yeah. I met these women. 1981. I met these women in New Jersey and they were amazing. I thought, God, they're so much better than a lot of the downtown performance artists I've seen. And so I, I wanted some cross fertilization to go on. You know? So, we, we, Peggy Shaw asked me if I wanted to perform at WOW, and I was like, yeah. And I thought, oh, that would be great, to bring these go-go dancers. So, we created a performance in which, you know, because as a go-go dancer, you're a decor. You're, you're wallpaper for the man's fantasy. But what if the decor started to talk, you know? So, we did um, this show that actually caused so much trouble. It was the first time that women had performed exotically at a women's festival. And my idea was always, you know, women have been performing sexually for men for decades. What would the aesthetic be like if we were performing for women? Anyway, um, a lot of people stopped talking to me. It just, you know, I was ostracized and, you know, par for the course. I don't care. <laughs> but then we got reviewed in somewhere, I don't know, it wasn't Village Boys, it was something like the Villager. And they said, oh, that this was the best performance in the whole festival. And after that, everybody started talking to me again. You know, in New York, politics goes by the wayside. When, when, when somebody gets a good review, like, oh yeah, oh you know I really liked your. Even people are telling me now, oh yeah, you know I always liked your go-go dancing. Class. How many years later is it? So, um, okay, whatever. But then navigating I, the um, sort of political correctness and, and being an artist and the sort of transgressive nature of being an artist and, and the kind of work that you, you, you're uh, being a punk artist, so to speak, and, and the economic reality, thank you. Uh, you you want some more too, yeah. uh, and, and the economic reality mm -hmm. of survival, even at that period, which was much easier to survive, mm -hmm. but still, um, one had to figure out how to pay one friend. You weren't getting paid at PS122. No. You weren't getting paid at WOW. Well, or you? No. I don't think so, but I mean, it has to do with regular income, and I, I read... And you don't want to be a secretary anymore. Well, I was actually working as a secretary as well, so the temp work was few and far between, you know, it wasn't all the time. Thank you. 
It was very funny. One time I was working as a secretary in this place called Morality in the Media, which was a Catholic organization during the and coca dancing at night. It was so funny. I loved that sort of juxtaposition because, you know, it was all... Anyway, I, I, I searched and searched and searched to find some information that would help me understand the dialectic of this whole situation. And um, I read Andrew Dworkin's pornography and I, I read it when I was go-to dancing and I realized this isn't, you know, she's not interested in sex workers. She's, you know, just offended by what we're, how we're portrayed. Well, through this friend Sarah Schulman, a friend of hers, Robin Epstein, who's a playwright, knew Andrew Dworkin and told Andrew Dworkin that I was reading her book while I was go dancing. And Andrea Dworkin called me up and, you know, we had this conversation. And I said to and Andrew Dworkin said, well, you know, this is so disrespectful. The woman shouldn't do this kind of work. And I said, oh, would you prefer a kind of covert sexuality, you know, as exists as a, as a secretary or a waitress? You try being a waitress and you don't smile or flirt with the customer. You're not going to get hit. You know, you're not, and as, as a secretary, you know, you're not available to go out and small talk with the boss and his friends and like respond girly to their bullshit. You know, and she said, she said uh, she didn't. She, she thought that that was preferable to working in the sex industry, and, and it was perpetuating um, this image of women, which was uh, detrimental because of the objectification of. And anyway, I said, you know, there's so many women that are working in the sex trade who don't have an education. And maybe a single mother with three children, they're bringing up on their own. What do you want them to do? Go and work at McDonald's for like three dollars an hour, which is what the lower, it was then, for three fifty, I think. And <coughs> so, you know, they're working, you know, they, they would work in a go-go bar and dance for three nights and they would be able to make enough money. I mean, what, what would you, and she, she wouldn't even go there. And, you know, in the end, I hung up the phone. Because I said, you know, I just, you know, reached an impasse with her. It's just impossible. She was standing in this higher moral ground. You know? She was, well, not only higher moral ground, but she was really vested in theory. And you were talking about the practical reality of these women's lives. And that's always, to me, been the, the, the dialectic. Definitely. Uh, uh, well, if we could all live in a perfect world, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I, my own, I've always been very concerned about people who do sex work. Um, and, and I'm using a general term which is not about prostitution mm. exclusively. It's about anything that plays upon uh, male desire, so to speak. Although you did try to explore what female desire might be at the same time. Yeah. Um, but, it, but it's always been clear to me that survival uh, it, it, you really need to be put into that motion. Um, it became very fashionable after the Bad Girl Feminist Conference at Columbia to say we're all whores, you know, we're wives, we're whores, we're all. Well, I always, I always thought, no, you're not all, you're not all whores. In reality, um, you have some choices and options, but, but some women have no choices and options. That's a way of denigrating the situation, denigrating the position of a woman who's, who's actually a sex worker by equating yourself with them. Like, you are in a position to be able to support yourself without being a sex worker. No, you're not a whore. <laughs> um, so it's denying what is really going on. You know? Were, did you know Karen Finley at this point? Uh, yeah, no, I saw her at um, Dance Tour, and you know, I mean, it was a small scene in the, in the East Village. Kathy Ak I mean, there were yeah, these all these kinds people. of uh, yeah. transgressive, feminist, uh, I think I, I was definitely on my own track, you know, I was, I mean, I was working as a yoga dancer and did that show at WOW and then brought, I was invited to a festival in Amsterdam the following year, 82, and it caused a riot. There were these women, all these dungaree lesbians, dungaree dykes as we call them. Who were totally offended by the performance. Didn't see. Did they see it, by the way? Yeah, they came. There were 1,300 women. We were performing on decadent night. And uh, they started throwing beer mats at us. And, and I was like, ah, I'm not performing. And then the director said, go back. And then they started throwing beer bottles. And then the electricity went out. And it was a riot. And we had to escape through the back door of the theater, which was through all the series of tunnels. We didn't know our way. Somebody. 
helped us, but on the way out, this woman from Suriname grabbed me by the arm, and I thought, oh my God, what's going on now? Because all these women arm linked themselves to the front door, these bulldog dykes arm linked themselves to the front door so we couldn't leave. And there were women asking for their money back because it wasn't the kind of performance they expected to see at a women's festival. Well, I mean, this is how women are surviving here, you know, and that's the whole point. Let me, let me look at it from a different angle. Pleasure. Mm. Um, dancers usually um, have no shame about their bodies mm. unless they're working on that issue through dance. But usually they're very body-centric. And uh, no one ever talks about that it might actually be pleasurable doing go-go dancing despite all the contradictions as opposed to this is a horrible thing I have to do and I'm just like... Mm. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, one of the things I did, I started bringing my own costumes and my own music, you know, 80s music, you know, like, um, um, Tainted Love, you know, Tainted Love and you know, Rick James. I mean, there was a lot of early Madonna, great stuff to dance to, you know. I just, I just brought in my own music because I just decided I was going to take control of the situation and do what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So then at the beginning, the men were sort of slightly... What is this? But then I started getting twenty dollar tips because I was sort of using rubber and rubber snakes and leather and you know playing around with all this stuff. It was my own exploration as well. Yeah. And this this guy, I so I started getting twenty dollar tips instead of one dollar tips. And then it was, oh, where's Tornado playing? That was my dad's name was Tornado. Where's Tornado playing next week? And so I became a yeah. And uh, so the the I became this kind of, un, you know, underground, uh, under Newark, under <laughs> Sea Caucus, under Patterson, you know, I mean, how can you be underground in this place, but you know what I mean? It was got a reputation and a yeah. following. Yeah, so I, 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 so I was just determined to do my own thing, actually, I was not, and I wanted to enjoy it, you know. Uh, Having a brother like Donald, Do you think you know? that that's an important element of, of finding a way to enjoy what you're doing, or, or if you can't enjoy it, then you should stop. Would you say that? Yeah, but I think a lot of people don't have the liberty to stop, you know? Okay. Um, one book that I read that was very helpful when I was go dancing was by Angela Carter, and it's called The Sadian Woman. Have you, have you read that book? Do you know who Angela Carter is? No. She's an English writer who I definitely recommend. But The Sadian Woman is an analysis of Marquis de Sade's um, Hundred Days of Sodom, and about the lives of Just Justine and Juliet. And the basic uh, premise of it is that morality demands a budget. And if you're going to have a morality, you better have. And she was a Marxist feminist and a, a, a fiction writer. And also, this was perhaps the first. I don't know she's written others, but I think this is a polemic that she really got a lot of response to. I, I wrote to her because it helped me get clarity about my situation and what, what I was doing, you know. Certainly Andrew, uh, 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 certainly, uh, Andrew Dworkin didn't, you know. You know, Shelley Morris, um, there was a documentary made about Shelley Morris in which she was very honest and forthright about the kind of work she did to survive. Mm. And she refused to let it be seen. And then what, sir? Refused to let it be seen. Oh. It was made by friends of hers and they hadn't got <coughs> <coughs> a release, and I did see it, oh. and I thought it was a remarkable huh. a piece. Of, huh. it, it had such integrity and honesty to it, and I thought it was very important <coughs> that young people, where we, we sort of normalize sex work, and yeah. it, 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 they see um, what the, how one navigates contradiction, particularly when you get used to the money. Mm. Nothing else pays that kind of That's no, true. Um, no. And I hope we someday that, I mean, I think that Shelley's a controversial performance artist, but I, I, I hope that someday she'll allow this film to be seen because I think it's one of the most important documentaries on a contemporary look at artists, cultural mm -hmm. worker, um, quote unquote right. sex worker. Right. Um, I'm not saying she's a prostitute or anything, just a sex worker, she's a massage therapist. That's probably a very good one. Um, the, so here we are, it's 1983, you've got leather dikes at the door not letting you out, 
Uh, you've got you've got angry, angry young lady guys uh, throwing bottles at you. It's almost a stereotype of um, of some of the people that we know and that we like, you know. <laughs> but these women from Suriname grabbed my arm. One of them grabbed my arm and said. Don't go, don't go. I have to tell you, we loved your performance. It's the first time we've ever seen white women performing like that. And that was as, as we were escaping out the back end of it, that we got validity from this nine, nine women from Suriname. So I was like, I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> So your work, your work, you've been doing these transgressive pieces, uh, trying to bring the material world into the art rarefied world of dance. Mm -hmm. And when did you begin to look at um, gender expression and the boundaries that are implicit in, in, in the cultural definition of gender? I think it happened when I was four years old with my brother who used was a little to, queen. Yep. <laughs> dress and drag and used to play with my dolls. I didn't I don't want to play with dolls. And um you know, he'd love to put all the dolls in my pram and then race them around the block and have them all animate and jump up and down and then he'd come back and say, Oh, Polly fell out and that and it was like ah. <laughs> and, and uh, oh, they were fighting, you know. And, you know he, he, he would sort of animate them so that they would, you know, by, by pushing them really hard. And that was his way of playing with my daughter. But there's a point where your cultural work mm. took on a different uh, focus. That was something true, and that happened um, with the commission I got from St. Mark's Dance Face in 1981, and I worked on this performance with. Bradley Wester, who's a visual yeah, artist. Yeah, a beautiful visual artist. And so Bradley and I, I, I invited him. He, he, he a lived... Beautiful um, gown he used to wear. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. He was a wonderful guy. And he lived... Uh, I lived on East 10th Street, and he was two doors down, I think. So we developed this performance, and it was called Arousing Reconstructions, which was performed at St. Mark's Church Dance Space in January 1982. And... In that performance, we tried to create a genderless choreography, a sort of androgynous choreography. A choreography. Oh my goodness, wait, say that word again. Androgynous to us? Yes. I just want to put that word out there. An androgynous, <laughs> yeah, and, and, yeah, well, that was our intention, was to have a, a choreography that was androgynous, that was neither male nor female, could be done by... Any gender, yes, any gender. So, and we succeeded with that, but within the rehearsal process, Bradley said, well, I want to dress as a woman. And we were so competitive, and I said, oh, well, I'm going to dress as a man. You know? So, we, we, within the performance, we did the androgynous movement vocabulary that we developed, and we also, it was a dance piece, but we also, he became... A man, a woman, and I became a man. But it wasn't. It was more cross-dressing. You know? yeah, it was external expression yeah. of what gender is supposed to mean. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, and that was in uh, January. We prevent, presented it in January 1982. Um, at that time, there wasn't any anything to read really around gender. I mean, I I read Michel Foucault. Uh, his Hercule Barbin and also um, History of Sexuality, which was out, and the people uh, who really were interesting to us was um, Deleuze and Guattari, A Thousand Plateau. Um, the, that really gave us some clues, but there was this one semio text book, and it, oh, what was it called? It was, on, it was on sex, and I don't, you might, I don't know if you remember this, but there was an image of a man who had killed himself through hanging, you know, while trying to achieve an erection at the back. He was in a closet. Anyway, there was uh, that, the material in there was very helpful, and you know, we we were grappling, we were trying to understand what it is that we were doing, and you know, we we were searching for new definitions, new ideas of. You know, and they trusted each other. Oh, totally, yeah. He was sort of like Donald. He was kind of like my Donald, you know. Very he pretty looked, too. looked like him. He was also yeah. very pretty. I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As was your brother. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and also, we fought like brother and sister, you know. And um, and it was a, a very enjoyable experience to work with him. But it kind of. Had your brother died at this point? No, he died in '92. Yeah. Um, 
And so that kind of, you know, got me on this journey of uh, developing a kind of idea of what it is to be a man. And I, all through the 80s, I was performing different male characters in different places, like the Pyramid Club and the Mud Club. I performed and also Dance Tyrio and I was Limbo Lounge um, mm -hmm. was another place. So, and then when night in night these were all uh, nightclubs that had a very specific cultural bent, and not only had live music and had DJ dancing, but also had performers uh, that were not musicians, so to speak. We're going to go back to this band in a, in a, in a bit. Oh, that's okay. But let's just stay on this track right yeah. now. Uh, so you were performing in drag? Would you call it drag? You, um, yeah, it was you, drag. Like John Sex Drag? Because he was hyper-sexual male. Who, John Sex? Yeah. No. No, it wasn't John Sex. It wasn't. It was more about taking on these different characters and performing them. And and also, you know, like, for instance, I had this Cockney mod character called Jack Spratt. Like this. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? All right? You know? Oh, my name's Jack Spratt. I'm a singer songwriter. I've got this uh, song I wrote 25 years ago. It's called Money. And then uh, I had this music. It was on an accordion. And I sang with the music. And I had this Cockney character who was very funny because he, you know, I was a mod in the 60s. And um, the mod scene has only ever been documented by men, and it's about men. And they, they don't ask women's opinion, you know. W women are not. I've never heard engaged. a woman say she was a mod before, but you know, no, but I was, and um, so actually, I wrote this monologue with a friend who, in, in England who was also a mod, and we remembered all these things about the guys, like they would be high on um, amphetamines all the time, and they could never get an erection, you know, because if you're yeah. on speed, you know, and you know stuff like that, you know. And they thought they were bad. And, and they all did because they were they were like peacocks, you know. Um, and so you as a girl, you had to be like the echo to their narcissism, you know, like they'd go, oh, do I look sharp? And you go, yeah, sharp, 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 sharp. <laughs> so that, that was your role. As a because the mods were about style. It was about style, totally, yeah. But it was all... Like working class for the most part. Yes, it was. And, and the men were like peacocks, really, you know, strutting about, you know. And having all these women to sort of just uh, accept, you know, I, I always had this objective perspective, having a brother like Donald and being able to grow up with him and learn how to do things like him, you know, think think the way that he thought, you know. Uh, although of course I couldn't think the way he thought, but he trained me. You know? But uh, anyways, you were asking about Arise and Reconstructions. Oh yes, yeah, so then in 1989, a friend of mine from Amsterdam was a sculptor was visiting Annie Sprinkle, and I didn't know Annie Sprinkle at that time, and uh, her name was Sonia Audendijk, and she knew Annie, and she knew me, and Annie said she was looking for a woman who could do female to male and make it look authentic, and she'd interviewed this transsexual Johnny Science, mm -hmm. and she wanted some illustration to go with it. Quite good band. Absolutely. So anyway, so she recommended me, and then Annie did this photo shoot with me, and that was in April 89. Did she take the picture? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of them was in the film. You know, the one with the, where they focus on my pubic hair yeah. for about 10 minutes. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that, that's an Annie Sprinkle photo. That's from that photo shoot, actually. Um, so, we did that, this photo shoot, and I met Johnny for the first time, and really, it was the first time I'd had authentic facial hair. You know, I didn't know how to do that myself. And I'd always sort of just messed about with crayons and whatever. And I went out that night to the Whitney Museum because it was an opening, it was the biennial, and I was supposed to meet some friends there. And I went with Sonia, and we immediately lost each other, and I was on my own. I was walking through the crowd, and I saw some friends, and I waved at them, and they just ignored me, and I... And then I, I realized everybody thinks I'm a man, because they were treating me differently. You know, people were just crowded, but people were making space for me. It never happens this way. And I thought, wow, oh, this is interesting. I'll just get myself a beer and go out to lead against me. So I was uh, standing with this beer and just observing the crowd, which is what men do. I'm checking everybody out. And this woman came up to me and started chatting me up. 
And I thought, oh my God, she must know that I'm a woman, you know? And I kept looking at her and thinking, she's the light is going to dawn, and it didn't. And the way she was chatting me up, it was embarrassing because I recognized her chat up to me. And then um, at some point, I couldn't stand it any longer, and I tried to sort of get away by like, turning my back to her, and she just would come around and talk to me some more. And she was very keen, you know? And that whole uh, phrase, treat them mean, keep them keen, it was very real to me at that moment. And uh, in the end, I just, against what I would do as a woman, I walked away from the situation. I went to, you know, I would never be that rude. So You're male. And I went to the second floor of the museum. I was looking at some paintings. Oh, yeah. I felt this tap on my shoulder, and she had followed me. And it was acting like we were together. And I was thinking, oh, my God, this is so embarrassing. And she could only see herself. And then I had this idea, well, this would be so cool if women had this opportunity to go out in the world as men, you know, find out and how the world treats you differently. Well, yeah. And actually, Johnny I was teaching something called Drag King Workshop. It was That was his idea. Johnny Science came up with that phrase, Drag King. And so he was teaching Drag King Workshop. Johnny was the person that Annie was interviewing. And he just started doing that. And I said, oh, well, I'm going to do that workshop. But it just involved makeup and dress up. And I said, well, if you're teaching a workshop, you've got to do some training. He said he didn't know how to do that. So I said, okay, well, why don't we work together? And so I would do the, he would do the makeup and styling and whatever, and I would, I would do the how to walk and how to sit and you know, take up space. And, you know, our acting exercises, you know, scene studies, that kind of thing. But, you know, my background is in theater, theater studies. And so he, he, he and I did a lot of these workshops, and we didn't even know that how popular they would become at the very beginning. We had no clue. And, you know, that was 89, 90. You know, by 93, there was a huge article in the Washington Post in the leisure section. And um, sorry, it's actually on my website if you go to articles. It was a man or woman? It was a woman. Paula, she took the workshop. <laughs> and, okay, we can, we can find it. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's tons of material, and, you know, and then I got lots of, in, and I, lots of invitations to uh, do this workshop, and uh, especially on talk shows, you know, and, and when that article in the Washington Post came out, my phone didn't stop ringing, and it was just like every talk show in America was calling me, and, you know, we come in, and I didn't know what to say, and none of them wanted to pay me, I was like, oh, well, why would I do this? Yeah. And then through a friend of Annie Sprinkle, Dolores French, who's a prostitute on television. And I think she was a prostitute, but then she got on all these talk shows as a prostitute. <laughs> and that became her income. You know. um, she said to me, well, you have to join the union, the American Federation of TV and Radio Artists. And at that time, it was 700. Yeah, after it, she said, you have to join after it. It was 700 bucks at that time, which was a lot of money. It's like 2,000 hours So anyway, I joined after it. And then every phone call I got, I, I asked if they had enough after contract. And they all, well, they either said yes, and they said no. You know, I remember one saying, what is about you artists that you always want to be paid. Isn't it enough we're giving you exposure? And I said, you know something? Time is money, and you're wasting mine right now. My time. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> it's like, you know, I, 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 did, I said to this person, you know, I'm one person. You want me to uphold a multi-million dollar corporation with my ideas? No way. You, know? you have to pay me. You know? Did anyone tell you? Yeah, they did. No, after the oh, no, I always got paid because of the after contract. Yes, yeah. but before that, I did Phil Donahue in '91, and they gave me a wages in lieu of unearned income. It's called because Phil Donahue no, had done. aesthetics. He had, he had ethics. <laughs> he had ethics. Well, so I was, we're, we're, we're traveling over sort of quickly a very important time. Mm. 80, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, okay? Um, other people, because of the drag thing, uh, in many ways people saw, will remember 
in, it still will remember your work as drag team work. Yes. When in fact, am I correct that your your work was not so much drag team work, but empowerment work of women to understand the boundaries of gender? that are unexpressed, that are internalized. Yeah, it's, it's a behavior that's learned. When, when, when Johnny and I first started teaching Drag King workshops, this is what Drag King meant to us. But as Drag King became part of popular culture, it came to be known, basically, as women dressing, you know, putting on facial hair, packing, putting on men's clothes, and performing for other women, you know. So it got taken up by the lesbian scene, which is fine. But so then, then Morris controversy happened. Shelley Morris actually became so much like the sexist male that numbers of women who would go to her performance uh, yeah. would object to the kind of man that mm. she had transformed herself into. Do you remember any of that? Of course, I, I used to perform together at the Pyramid Club. I remember that. So, how do you um, talk about this yin yang representation of the male? By a, a biological female. Well, I, I think that I thought it was very funny, and I thought she was parodying these like buffoon guys. It was almost like you know, it was comedy. She's a comic, you know. So he got, you thought it was unfair the kind of criticism that she was getting. I thought it was people who were just. Um, didn't have any sense of humor, you know. Sort of like the the Dutch women and the performance of the same kind of. Uh, you mean the, the, when we went there to perform? Yeah, it's like it's a political correctness gone crazy, you know. Shelly's obviously a very sensitive individual and she knows what she's doing. You know, you just have to watch Virgin Machine to see that, you know. Well, it's interesting when you're a transgressive artist. How you're still sort of um, who gets acceptable and, who, and when you cross the line, when when transgression is about crossing the line to, to some degree. But you know as well as I do that culture in this country is policed by the academy. Let's talk about that. Let's talk. About it's it's very it's very disturbing, you know. That that, but as artists, how do we survive? You know, we make a pact with the devil in a way by working with the academy. But without the academy, you know, would our work get recorded? You know, the book of mine, University of Michigan Press. You know, but at the same time that our work gets recorded, it also gets interpreted. You know, sort of like colonized. If you like. Academics too, they colonize work of artists. It's always interested me that academics are very well paid. Um, and they live in a, an ivory tower in some ways, it's a very privileged position to make a lot of judgments and, and, and challenge young people or students or uh, to do things that they themselves don't do themselves and, and then comment on it. And I, I, I'd much rather see some, you know, I won't say any names, but I'd much rather see them put their butt in the center of a different place and perform what they're talking about than pass judgment and, and set criteria that these young people, using the word generic, young people, attempt to do, to, to live up to, but are not realistic. They don't, they don't take in the real world. Well... There's a disconnect, you know, between conceptualizing and actually doing something. You know, it's a big disconnect. And you know, I've I've learned through the body. And I, you know, I have a whole training in dance and also in martial arts. I studied Aikido from 1977. I still do Aikido. I have a third degree black belt from New York I High, and that was what saved my ass in New York doing Aikido. Um, that kid was like, you, when you say save my ass in, in physical and threatening situations, oh, that or a sense of self? Both. But, you know, Aikido was sort of like, it was like my parent. You know, Aikido kind of disciplined me, you know. Um, and I, you know, I have a parent who's just me, you know. So Aikido was 
going to Aikido, you know, once or even twice a day when I was really into it, you know, a few times, going to Aikido a lot, and, and becoming really good at it, and, and then enjoying uh, all the possibilities of the body, what you can do with the body. I mean, it's, it's so exciting. Um, <coughs> so you're on the trajectory of doing these workshops with Johnny. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, and, and, um, not, would I be correct in saying that they were less about entertainment and more about empowerment? Well, I, I think it's more about exploring the possibility to be more, to be more, more than who, who you are, than this allotted role that you're given as a woman, which is so limited. You know, this is a woman, you know, that all this behavior is expected of you, you know, that you're going to look desirable, that you're going to have a, a be pleasant, be nice to people all the time, be ready to smile, um, acceptability, you know, and what's called normal behavior is, is such a construction. So maybe you're having a horrible day and you, you're still expected to smile, make everybody else feel good. That's sort of woman's role. It's like it's all about everybody else and how the people respond to you. It's not about you, how you're doing, you know. So. That was something that I, I saw that men were able to do. They could be in their own world and psh, don't care what other people think. Just do what they want to do. And even to the point that they are so vulgar and then they do stuff like, you know, I never see women doing that. You know, I'm just extreme, but I'm just saying that it was about them having the option to be more, you know, expanding, expanding. Let me ask you a dangerous question in our postmodern age. Do you think that there is a fundamental difference between men and women? Um, you know, it's the old nature-nurture debate, and that will never, ever be solved, because testosterone does do things to people, just as estrogen does, too. Um, but, you know, you have so many people that don't fit the stereotype, you know? You have mannish women, you have effeminate men, you have... Isn't that gender expression? Pardon? Isn't that the range of gender expression? Uh, that gets police? I think, I think a lot of people conform to being a man or a woman just because it's easier to live like that, you know? I'm talking more about the body, the yeah. body itself. <coughs> uh, female bodies and male bodies are different, physically different. Uh, no matter what the external presentation may be, the internal looks are not changeable. Mm. And what does that mean uh, uh, in terms of, not in terms of power, but in terms of personhood? Are you talking about identity? Well, identity seems to be about externals. I'm talking about the actual physical body, uh, the science of the physical body, um, Men never have ages. Uh, women, I mean, they're just basic fundamental yeah, differences. Yeah, I, I know. And uh, and we can talk about cultural history and how that has uh, constructed the gender roles that goes to the body. That is, the reproduction is usually reproduction and property yeah. are usually the, the basic sort of uh, conditioning principle. But I'm, I'm we, we live in a particular moment where people are doing everything in the world to deny their body and create the subjective fantasy of who they are. Yeah. Uh, and the academic community has very much put that forward, that subjectivity is much more important than concrete reality of, of, of one's own body. And does that create a tension? Is it important to sort of what I'm asking you to do uh, as someone who has really um, jumped the borders of expression? Uh, but do you, we talked a little while ago about androgyny, which is a physical representation. Um, and I worry, this just made me my friend, Diana, and we don't have to agree on it. But I, it's hard to raise a question anywhere because people's feelings get hurt. Because you know, what? People's feelings get hurt. You can't say you are born a female. You know, or you were born a male. It doesn't, regardless of how you self-identify, subjectively identify, uh, call yourself, dress as you are, 
the denial of, 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 of body seems to be very much a part of the current dialectic that we're in. Do you have any reaction to what I just said? Well, I, you see, there's so much in our biological heritage that is never considered. The fact that, you know, we, we evolved over five billion years to become the bipeds that we are, and all of the different organisms, the reptilian, the amphibian, the quadruped, all of the, all of that biological heritage that's gone into who we are. And yet we, we confine this idea of who, of who we are to some, you know, who your family is or who your friends are, you know, what your history is or who you're connected to. But what about that? It's a very basic instinctive thing, you know. What about the instinctual aspect of personhood, you know? Um, the gut reaction, how, how people respond to that. I mean, this is an issue because what happens through the process of conceptualization is that you deny your animal instincts, you know. And when I say animal, we are animals, we're human animals. And that, I think, has a lot... Your natural instinct. Your, your, in, your instinct. And, and people are so removed from it that they don't even know what those instincts are. I mean, say you're in a restaurant and you're with a group of people and there's somebody at the next table. The candle overturns and the serviette catches fire. The person looks at the fire. My animal instinct would be to get the water jug and put, but they look at the fire. This happened. I saw this. I witnessed this. And I thought, where is their fear? Where is their response? Where is their animal instinct? Danger. Water. Nothing. And, and this, I find this very dangerous, you know. If, if we if we're not in touch with those very basic things that animals have, you know, what is the time to leave, you know, what is the time to, like, really go for it, or, you know, I mean, these, these are animal instincts, it's like knowing gut, gut level what you, what you ought to do at any point in time. Let me ask it a different way. Um, do you think that gender identity trumps physical reality? <laughs> You know, the thing about gender identity is that somebody who defines themselves as something, you know, a trans woman, they define themselves as a woman, but as a physical reality, you can look at them and say, that person's male, because they have uh, Adam's apple, they have a deep, deep voice. But the reality is that we aren't in any position to, I think, to, to, to you know, make some qualification about somebody else's identity, how they identify themselves. I, I, I really don't feel that. I mean, somebody looks like a woman and identifies as, as a man, then that's what they decide. I don't know. <laughs> it's a very, I mean, we're in this moment where these are the large questions which are very hard to talk about. Right, um, and uh, I've always believed, and I think it's a feminist principle, that sure. we each have the right to control our body, and no one else should be policing or controlling of my body. But as a feminist, uh, being female had, has historically had, from a feminist point of view, a real definition. And it's now being challenged by men to say, I am woman, or by women who reject being a woman and say, I am man. And that kind of tension, which, is, which I feel a lot around us today, it's, it's sort of your work brought to a certain point. And then, to me, a very important book is, is uh, Jack Halberstone, Jimmy Halberstone, for female masculinity. Well, in which he totally dishes me. He totally dishes He never did a workshop with me. And that's one thing. Well, that's Jack, then. Yeah, it doesn't does. matter. His scholarship is questionable. Okay. And, and that's what Steve Bottom is taking. I, I honestly don't have any time for him, really. I, I just don't. I just had suffered. If he's not willing to do the research and realize, 
uh, recognize or acknowledge the work that other people have done because he is so narcissistic he needs to own it for himself you know this is a community it's not just one person who's doing all this stuff let's, let's, let's contrast uh, Peggy Shaw and Jack Peggy Shaw's sort of female masculinity and um, female masculine beauty in a sense and, and Jack sort of aggressive attitudinal um, swagger. He's a poser. He's a poser. I, I met him, the day that I met him, I just had come from an Aikido class and I went to meet him at 15th Street Starbucks on 8th Avenue and he was putting on this whole box of act and I, my immediate reaction was to just floor him. I could have done it with one swipe, yeah? And he was, I remember him talking about fans and, and sort of putting down this fan woman. I can't remember what he said exactly. I had just left my Aikido dojo. It was a lunch class. And those women were going back to work. There's a black belt woman putting on the earrings, going on the going back to work. I thought, you would see that fan in the street, and she could kill you in an instant. You know? And here you are. He was a total poser. He was a total pose. You know? I have no time for that. Let's talk about Peggy. But Peggy's a different kettle of fish. Really. Yes, but, but both of them present themselves as a representation of female masculinity. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that's true. And, but then, but Peggy never takes on the swagger of patriarchy, of, of masculine aggression that uh, I think Jack does, you know, in, in his presentation publicly anyway. I don't know about how he conducts himself in the world. And I don't want to dwell too much on that. But I've always been fascinated with Peggy's ability to be sexy, romantic, and it's not even butch. It's masculine. I mean, there's a difference. It's very different. But I think hers is coming from a certain physicality, you know. And whereas Harveston has constructed her, I, I mean, I don't know if it's true, but it seemed to me Harveston has constructed a masculinity, which I didn't think of as authentic. But I mean, how can you call anything inauthentic? Because it just is, you know. But, um, you know, I, I'm just explaining. I came from an Aikido class where there was some serious masculine behavior. All right, so let's, let's move forward because you have to go. And like, so I, I have to leave now, actually. Yeah, then we'll do five minutes. Okay. Five minutes. Um, the piece about Donald is about brother, sister. It is about this wonderful secret that you shared, that you shared with all of us last night, that you yeah. both promised each other that you would fight each other. And he died of age in 92, and this is you keeping your side of the bargain and presenting Donald to multimedia to us. Um, what kind of nourishment as a child and then as an adult did you get from your brother? Uh, I think Donald taught me to think for myself, and he also taught me not, he didn't care what anybody thought, you know, it was important to think for yourself and go your own way and pursue what it is that you wanted to do and, and to be relentless about it, you know. very Scottish today. Well, we did grow up in Scotland, but I think the Scottish people are very concerned about what other people think of them. And he certainly wasn't. You know, he was very flamboyant, very campy, always. Oh, that was Donald. Nobody said, oh, he's gay. It was like, oh, that's Donald. He's just dramatic, you know. So oh, he got away. cold word for gay, dramatic. Dramatic, yeah. <laughs> but he got away with a lot of... Got away with everything. So like, I couldn't get away with what he got away with. That used to yeah, drive he's also very, very beautiful. Oh, yeah. Well, exactly. He could charm people, yeah. you know. So no, he he told me a lot. One yeah. final question, and I could I would love to just continue this for another three hours. Well, we could talk another time, you know, if you want. Who are the thinkers today? Everyone seems to be publishing something. There's always seems to be some place you can publish. But who do you think you would say? I wish I hope that people would read this person because it sort of challenges me. It makes me think. It's interesting. Uh, you know, I, I think I think it's more for me about performance because that's my genre, and I think about performers that I've seen and the work that they've done. And there's, um, well, I'm living in, in the UK, right? There's two sisters, Amy 
Cade and Rosanna Cade, and they, Rosanna's a lesbian, and her sister is a sex worker, and they've done this amazing film. It's been naked the whole time. It's going to be on Edinburgh this uh, summer in August. They really, between them, challenge all the prejudices that people might have around issues of being a lesbian or being a sex worker or. Uh, and what they share as sisters, you know, and it, it was a very strong performance. Um, and and so that that's one thing that I would say, you know, people should see. And the other performance I saw was uh, this is all recent stuff, you know. This woman called Foxy and Hus. She has a show called Foxy and Hus. She's based in London, where she has this fox character that she performed all these performances and what she does she lip syncs uh, she, she records conversations like for instance her, her grandmother told her this whole story about falling in love and what it was to be falling in love and, and then when her husband stopped being in love with her and what that felt like and it, it was incredible her grandmother was very articulate and wonderful language she used to language and she lip synced all the words of her grandmother uh, okay. and performed it and demonstrated the whole so you as the audience are going through this process of falling in love and processing now you lip sync in the Donald Trump <laughs> yes what does lip syncing do for you like you, this woman you just described what is the art of lip syncing do to for or to the performance it's about accuracy you know, it, 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 and it's about getting all the nuance of, of the song without having to sing it. But I mean, it's also about listening, listening very closely. You know, you have to listen very, very closely. Does it give you a freedom to express physically that the words, because you're not concentrating on the words? Yes. I mean, this is the drag queen sort of yeah. lip sync magic yeah. is the uh, expression. Yeah. You know. The, uh, two tiny questions, big questions but tiny. Um, Diz Band was back this year for a one time only performance. 30 years later, you didn't talk about your association with the art feminist of the late 70s, which, which was who was in this band, Martha Wilson, yeah. uh, and yourself, and a whole bunch of other people. What, did, what was it like to perform? With these women, once again, those songs from 30 years ago, which were supposed to change the world. Well, it was it was disturbing that they're still contemporary. I mean, there are some new songs in there, um, and you know that the one where I'm playing the harmonica, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's a new song I wrote. Because so we had a residency at McDowell to work on some new work, um, and we we had performed before. Actually, we performed. That wasn't the first time that we had a reunion. The whack. Uh, the, yeah, the whack, and also we went to South Korea and performed to the festival. Yeah. So we we have continued, to, but it is disturbing that a lot of the songs are still relevant. You know, the, the, the political material, you know, about nuclear power, and it's still relevant. It's disturbing that it's still relevant. You know. And what about the body issue? The fact that we're all getting older. Yes, I mean, this is something people don't like to talk about. You are all artists who people look at, you know, and see that you age. Well, this is this is what happens. People get older, get used to it. <laughs> what can I say? No, but we live in an age of society. I know, but I don't. I don't obey those rules. I'm not interested. I'm, you know, I'm this age, and so. How did you confront that? I don't. I just am. This is who I am. I'm not going to defend anything. What's that to defend? You, well, you, you grow so, older. And, you know. I, I'm not being critical of this at all. No, I know. Uh, but one looks in the mirror, and uh, I'm always for a long time I got away with being looking very young, much longer than I than I was young, <laughs> and it became a trap in many ways uh, because people treated me right. as this young thing rather than someone with a brain. Uh, but one day you wake up and you look in the mirror and you're like, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, you really look in the mirror. It's true. And it's the Vivian Lee moment from Ship of Fools. And she had a very negative reaction. But I try to tell people, yeah, this is what I look like. This is know? who I am. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I know. Well, I have the same thing. Yeah. But, you know, we're also not in... We're not uh, in Hollywood. and You know, I mean, all, all of that... 
the, you know, face lifts and stuff. That's all necessary if you're going to be. And how, I mean, that's how Hollywood is. It's all artificial. So, you know, it's all constructed. I heard this is a story, which I don't know if it's true or not, yesterday, that Bill Clinton had gone to Hillary and said, you have to get a face look. And she refused to get a face look, and he did. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's the big, that's the natural mass narcissism of the male. <laughs> um, just a little well, aside. The last question. But you know, I really have to go because. Yeah, last it's, question is. Yeah. Do you believe in love? Of course. That was visible in the performance last night, wasn't it? Yeah. There was a lot of love in that performance. Is, is, are you ever too old to love? Of course not. That's what keeps us all going. Thank you. Thank I'm, you, Diane. Yeah, I love it. <laughs>